Hey. So here we are. Monday, June 13th, 2022. My name's Larissa. Oh my God. So, last night, last night, barbecued yellow peas and greens and then had some rice in the rice cooker. Oh my gosh. The light is so weird here. I put the sunglasses back on. And it was really good. It was really, really good. What are you doing, Brody? Don't go far. Don't go far. Don't go where Mama can't see you. Okay. You good boy. What a good boy. He's so good. He is. He's so good. He's such a good being. You are. You're a good being. You gonna come over? You gonna come over and say hi? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Jumpy up. Oh, there he is. There he is, president of the shitty committee. If, if you find a ball, if you find a ball. Although mama's, mama's arm is feeling a little funky. It's feeling a little funky. Mm. So what are we going to do today first? Card reading or book reading? Mm. I think, this is what I think. I think a lot of my stuff is on the dark web. And I think that there is somebody who's hacked in and that's how they know where I am and how I get followed around and how somebody knows like stuff that's going on in and around my house because we have nest cams. That's what I think. I think somebody has my information and that they hack into my photos and that they're selling it. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. The sun is so bright. Mmm. Glowy eyeballs. Me and my eyeballs. My crazy eyeballs. My eyeballs change color. They do. They totally change color. Mm hmm I used to think it was because of, 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 you know, whatever I was wearing, but it's not. It's not. It doesn't seem to have any, make any difference. I wear. And they just change color sometimes. They do. Anyway. Let's do a story first. Who are we going to do? Who you want to meet? He found a ball. I got to toss the ball for him. Okay. Consenting adults. An intimate exploration by me. Let's do Denny. We need Denny. Denny's the first one I wrote. And so this was on, what day did I start the books? January 18th. So this was written the morning of January 18th. Denny. Sometimes a very small thing can make the biggest difference. Denny was absorbed in his task he pulled the microphone closer to his mouth as he made an announcement over the loudspeaker. Will the owner of the dark gray BMW please come to the service desk? Your lights are on. Denny dug in the shallow drawer in front of him for the re-entry hand stamp. He scanned the closed circuit screens in front of him while giving the car's owner a chance to respond to his message. In the screen to the right of his coffee mug, he saw her. A petite, curvy woman with tussled shoulder-length hair patted her jacket pocket, pulled out her BMW keychain, and turned toward the camera, then headed toward his desk. For a moment, she looked directly into the camera. It was just a quick glance. Her movements were small, not grand and sweeping. Her walk was quick and small steps, nothing remarkable. But Denny had a strange feeling about this woman he probably wouldn't have even noticed otherwise. It was like... He knew a secret about her. It was strange. He felt himself blushing, and he didn't know why. He felt sweat beating in his cool palms as he looked up over the counter in front of him and saw the woman walking toward him decisively. The, the look on her face was unreadable. But the closer she got, the stronger the strange feeling became. His mouth became dry as she rested her right hand and her keys on the counter. Is this the service desk? she asked. Denny swallowed hard. Of course it was the service desk. There was a, there was a large sign above his head announcing that fact. 
He opened his mouth to answer, but only an audible breath escaped his lips. I have a charcoal color BMW, the woman offered. Her voice was soft, but it seemed to reverberate through Denny's body. He desperately wanted to hear her say something else. Anything else. Um, yeah, a, a dark gray BMW, Denny said lamely. Yeah, so do you need to stamp my hand or something? The woman asked a bit impatiently. Denny fumbled with the stamp he was holding so tightly. Yes, yeah, I mean, give me your hand, he finally managed. The woman extended her left hand, offering him the top with her wrist slightly bent. Danny, groped, Danny dropped the stamp and had to bend down under his desk to retrieve it. In looking for the small round object, he caught sight of her feet. They were tiny, with what seemed freshly painted, champagne-colored nails displayed in strappy but sturdy and comfortable sandals. They were so perfect-looking, he wanted to touch them to make sure they were real. Then he saw the stamp just to the outside of her left foot. As he reached for it, his hand just slightly brushed her pinky toe. She pulled her foot away as Denny bumped his head on the underside of the desk. Oh, I'm so sorry, he blurted as he stood up. The woman's hand was still extended. He didn't look at her face as he lightly grasped her fingertips and pressed the stamp to the back of her hand, leaving a black star and the day's date. Mm, thanks, the woman said as she turned toward the door leading out to the convention center parking lot. Denny watched her walk away, the soft jersey fabric of her loose-fitting dress pulling back and forth over her bum. There was no visible panty line. She must be wearing a thong. Nice. The voice of his buddy Gordon broke, the, his, broke his trance. Uh, hey, Den. Thanks again for volunteering to help me out here. I got two of my brothers coming tomorrow, so you don't have to come tomorrow if you don't want to. Denny hadn't really wanted to be there to begin with, but Gordon had helped him the month before move his stuff out of Nikki's apartment on short notice when she revealed she was pregnant and it wasn't his. So, he felt he owed it to him when Gordon asked. If Gordon had told him this just an hour ago, he would have been thrilled, but now he had interest in being there. No, man, it's okay. It's not so bad a way to spend a weekend, Denny said, trying to, turning to face his friend. Gordon had a smirk on his face. Way to go, buddy. Silly dog. What, did you suddenly develop an interest in arts and crafts? Or maybe some crafty wench, Gordon laughed. Denny blushed as Gordon was called away by some old gray-haired lady with a grizzled-looking lap dog under her arm at a, at a nearby booth. Denny turned his eyes back to the door to watch for the woman. It didn't take long. The event wasn't scheduled to officially open for another hour and a half. Everyone who was there was either a vendor, organizer, or volunteer like him. The woman brushed the hair from her eyes as she pushed, the, as she pushed through the glass doors. A smile turned his lips momentarily as she turned toward him and the, and the service desk, but he tried to make his face expressionless as her eyes met his, noticing she looked distraught. She approached the desk slightly out of breath. Is, is there something I can help you with? He asked, almost hopefully. I don't know. Is there security in the parking lot? Denny didn't know and found himself blushing in embarrassment. It seemed like information the guy at the service desk should know. Did something happen? He asked, answering her question with one of his own. Yeah, I didn't leave my lights on. Someone turned them on when they broke into my car, the woman answered almost as flatly as she had earlier inquired about the service desk. Oh, well, that's upsetting, Denny replied. The woman did not appear to be amused by Denny's small talk. Yeah, and they keyed the driver's side, so is there security in the parking lot or not? Any cameras? She asked, gesturing toward the closed-circuit screens Denny was supposed to be watching. The reminder of his assigned task embarrassed him once again as it dawned on him that he was the security. In fact, one of the screens was from the parking lot, but the camera was mounted on the lot attendant kiosk. The kiosk had recently been updated to be an unmanned to be unmanned and operated by a credit card reader, and the camera was positioned to catch the license plates of the vehicles entering and exiting the lot. Denny sighed as he answered the woman. 
Yeah, but it's only one camera, and it's on the kiosk, not pointed on the lot. Well, a lot of good that does me, the woman said as she dug in her jacket pocket, retrieving a cell phone. I doubt the cops will be much help, he said, as she watched as he watched her dial the phone. It's a private lot. Oh, I'm not calling them. My ex is a cop, the woman said, as Denny heard another woman's voice answer the answer the call. Yeah, I guess you decided to pay me a visit, Mom, the woman said into the phone. Her mother's voice was muffled, and Denny couldn't hear exactly what she said. He he could only really hear the woman. Oh, he just broke into the car and took Digger's training harness and keyed the car, then left the lights on. The woman paused as her mother spoke on the other end. I don't know. I guess he was hoping to drain the battery. Please keep Digger in the house with you. I, I think he might, be, he might be trying to take him. The woman paused again. Denny was starting to feel awkward. I know. I'm sorry. I'll see if I can bring him with me tomorrow so you don't have to. I've seen a couple other dogs here. I'm guessing I'll be back there around nine. Things close... Things here close at six, and I'll need to lock stuff up before I leave. The woman paused again. Denny shifted his weight before sitting down in his, in his chair. I won't. I'll come right there after. The woman hung up, then turned her gaze back to Denny, who was absently watching the security screens now. Pardon me. I'm sorry. Do you know if I can bring my dog with me tomorrow? The woman asked Denny. Denny looked up from the screens into the woman's eyes. Both of them stopped. Something changed in her expression, and Denny just knew she felt it now, too. That strange feeling he felt when he first saw her on the screen, responding to his announcement. The feeling was electric or magnetic or heavy. It was something. He didn't know what. Neither did she. Denny got up and walked around the counter to face the woman, and the energy he felt passing between them. He wanted to hold her, and this took him off guard. Just last night, he had been looking at an old photo of Nikki and him at the beach last summer and jerking off. Now, unex unexplainably, he was looking at this strange woman who was oddly calm given his understanding of her situation and wanted to hold her, smooth her hair, cradle her to his chest, and breathe her in. It was deeper than primal. "'Can I walk you to your booth?' Denny asked, his voice suddenly filled with a protective authority. The woman seemed to relax somewhat. Yes, thank you. Can I bring my dog? She asked again as they turned in the direction of her booth. I don't see why not. Other folks brought their dogs. What kind of dog is it? Oh, he's just a mutt. My ex and I found him almost dead when we were hiking Yosemite last year. I'm the one who paid all the vet bills, but he wants the dog. Well, he doesn't really want the dog. He just wants to hurt me. He's allergic to dogs, the woman said, shaking her head. How long has he been stalking you? Denny asked. They were now standing in front of the woman's booth. Vintage sports banners and jerseys from various sports and teams from around the globe were displayed on portable walls. Denny's breath caught in his throat. He thought he just might be in love. This was urgent. Since we broke up the week after he got back from the week after we got back from Yosemite, so I don't know, maybe nine, ten months now. A long strand of hair was hanging over her right eye. Denny brazenly brushed it away smoothing her windblown-looking hair behind her ear. The woman caught his hand in hers and held it to her cheek. I don't know what's happening here, Denny said apologetically. Please, tell me if I'm out of line, he whispered, stepping close into her. I don't either, but it's okay, the woman replied. I want to protect you, Denny stated softly but confidently. He couldn't believe what was coming out of his mouth. He couldn't believe she was letting him stand so close to her like this. It was like something else had taken over both of them. I don't know how you can, the woman answered in a defeated tone. Denny could smell a light floral fragrance coming from her hair as he slid his hand under her tresses to cradle the nape of her neck. She placed her hand on his chest over his heart and looked, looked up to meet his eyes before re repeating, I don't think you can. Denny leaned down and whispered through her hair into her ear, please let me try. Time seemed to be stopped. Everything seemed to slow and the only thing Denny was aware of was he and this woman, and the way their hearts seemed to be synchronized. I want to try, he reiterated. He knows you're here. I think you'd be safer if we packed up and went to get Digger now. Denny's face was buried in the woman's hair. As he said this, no one was more shocked by his behavior than he was. In fact, the woman seemed to expect it, anticipate it. She turned her cheek to press against his, allowing her lips to graze the lobe of his ear as she answered him. Okay, was all she said, and the choice was made for them both. Well, 
Wasn't that one a hot one? <sighs> Brody, where's the ball, buddy? I've had men say strange things like that to me. I have. I've had a couple women say stuff like that to me, too. I don't know. I'm not gay, like, in any way. So that always made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, it's uncomfortable enough when, it's, when, a, when a man who's a stranger is forward. But, like, for me, it, it, was, it's, it was even more awkward when it was a woman. Because then it's just like, like, no, I'm sorry that you got that vibe from me, but no. What? What? I used to know this woman, Jody. We were friends. We met in a we met in a group, right? And um, she and I were the only two women in the group. Everybody else were, were, were guys. And and uh, I felt a camaraderie with her, I guess, because we were the two women in the group. And we hung out a couple times. And um, she got the wrong idea. You know, one night, um, I was doing a lot of uh, open mic performing at that time. And one night, I was out performing, and she had come out to, to see, right? And she saw me, you know, perform. And then after that, she knew. And we were, we were sitting at the, at a table after I got off stage. And she's like, oh, she's Larissa. She's I'm really sorry. She's like, I think I got it now. I'm like, what? She's like, you just give everybody your full attention when you talk to them. She had thought, like, I, I was taken aback when she said that to me. Because, like, are human beings so starved for attention that, and, and human decency, that when they do and encounter it, they assume that it's sexual immediately? I don't know. It's part of the reason why I, I, I keep to myself a lot more than I used to. I don't, I don't need anybody misinterpreting, you know, I'm pretty clear. I'm pretty clear when I'm interested like that, right? I'm pretty blatant, but, um, you know, historically, but just cause I talk to somebody, it's like, I don't even like smiling at people. I don't want to, lest anybody think that I'm, you know, coming on to them cause I smile at them. Ridiculous. Then you get all these people, why don't you smile at me? Why aren't you smiling? Why aren't you smiling? Because when I smile at people, they think I'm coming on to them. So, save you all the trouble. I just won't smile. <sighs> Crazy people. Crazy people in this world. Crazy people. Cops. Like, I'm sure, like, I'm sure there's cops out there that do the job. I'm sure. I'm sure there are. But I've had a lot more negative experiences. Like, the guy, Neil, the beat cop in Pontiac when I worked in Pontiac, right? At the gallery when I was in college and I wouldn't go out with him. So he wouldn't respond to my calls and I got mugged that time. Eight dollars and a Hollywood video card. Eight dollars and a Hollywood video card. That's what they stole from me. Guy had a gun, stuffed in the back of his pants. I could see Neil up at the corner. Yap in his trap with Sid, the guy that Omar bought my, my engagement ring from. Right? He's yapping his trap with Sid. And I was, you know, hollering up at him, hey Neil! And I could still see the guy and his girlfriend that had just mugged me. We're just blocked down the street still, standing there, and Neil was just laughing. He's like, yeah, I'll see you later, Larissa. I'm like, no, no, you won't. He's a dick. He was such a dick. Seriously. Seriously. Oh, my clothes and the windows in the house. It's starting to get warm again. It is. Who knows? Yesterday was not a booby in the sunshine day. Maybe today will be a booby in the sunshine day. What do you think, Brody? Is it going to be a booby in a sunshine day? Brody loves boobies. He, he does. He's a sneaky booby licker. He will, he, anytime. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the boobies look like. Big, small, doesn't matter. It, Brody loves boobies. You're a booby man. He's looking at me. He's like, he, I'm saying booby. And his face is like, yeah. 
<laughs> I have to, it's, it's, don't, lick, don't lick my boobies. You know, trying to lick my boobies. Omar laughs. He thinks it's funny. Not like he's licking my boobies, right? Or he's like, I'll lick them. <laughs> no interspecies loving like that, you know? I'm against it. I'm against that interspecies loving. <laughs> no, thank you. Although I've seen a couple gorillas with nice bums. <laughs> Watching videos of animals. Oh. It's okay, buddy. It's okay. People are allowed to drive on the street. You don't own the street. No, ever since we've had... He, he's really protective of me. Brody is. He's super protective of me. He is. If he doesn't like somebody being around me, he'll like try to sit on me, to like cover me up. That's like what he does. He tries to cover my, my body with his body. If he doesn't like somebody. Yeah. He's like, yep, that's what I do. Is that what you do, buddy? Come on. Come up and say hi again. I, you No, you have to bring me the ball. I don't know where the ball is. Let's see what do Tay's cards have to say. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You saw me shuffle these cards, right? All right. So, in the center, embracing the shadow, shadow love, number 13. Today's the 13th. Today's the 13th. It's an interesting stone. It looks like a, a calcite, right? The way it has striation in it like that, that regular striation. Hmm. And forces at play that you may not be aware of reversed energizer communication, number 14. There was some there was some cross communication. Cross communications, yeah. It happens sometimes. It does. It happens. And forces at play that you're probably aware of. Upright one. Divine temple. Akashic records. Oh, yeah. Dropping wisdom. Dropping wisdom. Wisdom bombs, baby. Wisdom bombs. And course of action. Personal power. Self-empowerment. 33 reversed. Oh, going to have to accept some help. Right? Can't do it all alone. Can't do it all alone. That 33, though, that for me is also... that. I've talked about it. They have, they have the Christ consciousness uh, card in this deck. But for me, the number 33, because he was crucified at 33, right? So I always tell people when, when they turn 33, I always tell them, congratulations, I'm not getting crucified. Good for you. Take a lesson from Jesus. Don't get crucified. And the outcome, we have a reverse 24, fifth dimensional activation, Palladian Azurite disc. Okay. And shut the third eye for a little bit. Sometimes the third eye gotta take a rest. Sometimes the third eye gotta take a rest too. Anyway, let's see what the angels have to say. Miss Dorian Virtue, how you doing, baby? How you doing? How you doing, nice lady? Seriously, you used to be all cheerful, and then when you got when you when you found Jesus, when you were when you got born again, you always seemed so dower i although you know what i i can understand that being around religious people being being involved in 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 organized religion no matter what kind it is mm, it's a buzzkill total total buzzkill so in the center on the 13 up, upright 13 embracing the shadow shadow love we have an upright 10 of earth, a very happy family life, financial security, finding magic in the little things in life. And forces at play that you may not be aware of on top of the reversed 14 communication. We have an upright 21, the world Archangel Michael. Job well done. Joy, com uh, contentment, and gratitude, the path towards enlightenment. See, sometimes, sometimes when the message doesn't get through, it's, it's not a bad thing, right? Sometimes, sometimes a little delay in play is, is, ain't so bad. 
So on forces at play that you're probably aware of, on top of the upright one, we have a reversed 18, the moon, Archangel Haniel, important psychic insights, events behind the scenes, release fears that hold you back. Oh, somebody, somebody's a little anxious. Somebody's a little anxious. And course of action on the reverse 33, personal power. Um, we have a reversed eight of water, a desire to move on, the search for something more meaningful, spiritual and emotional growth. So no, not wanting to move on. Found what you wanted. Found what you wanted. Want to stick around. Found what you wanted. Want to stick around. And, and the outcome on the reverse 24, fifth dimensional activation, closing that third eye, taking, giving that third eye a little rest for a while. We got an upright zero, the dreamer, Archangel Metatron, a leap of faith, follow your dreams, unexpected opportunities. Hmm. Not looking ahead. Don't use that third eye. Just keep that third eye shut for a little bit. Let things happen, right? You never know. <coughs> I had a funky dream last night. I did. I had a funky dream that I was back at the Cottonwood Studios in Oakland. And Carrie Santee had a fucking beard. Ugh. If I ever have to see that place again, it'll be too soon. Seeing what Osho got to say. Oh, I bet you Carrie would be all happy to see me, to see me chubby now. They were always all bent out of shape. Cause, cause, cause I was thin. And then when I booked, I booked a, booked the stage, I had a comedian that told some fat jokes and they were all bent out of shape that I booked this comedian that told fat jokes. And I told them, I said, I've been fat before. You guys understand that. I've been fat before. Once a fat girl, always a fat girl. Sorry, Adele. You still a fat girl. You a fat girl. I saw you do the thing about eating a spotted dick. If, if eating food is supposed to be erotic and you're doing it, you're a fat girl. Doesn't matter what size you are. <laughs> Sorry. How about I'm like burst a bubble? Once a fat girl, always a fat girl. That's the way it goes. So, anyway, they were really nasty to me after that. All bent out of shape. She was a dippy broad. Seriously, totally dippy broad. <sighs> Whew. Wow, we only got one upright here in this pool. So in the center, on the upright 13, embracing the shadow, and the upright 10 of earth. Uh, financial security. We have an upright Roman numeral three creativity. Oh yeah, look at her there making stuff. Being super creative. And then forces at play that you may not be aware of on the reversed 14 communication and the upright 21 the world, which is a major arcana card, by the way. We have another major arcana card, but this time it's reversed going with the flow. Somebody's not going with the flow. They're putting their foot down saying, no, not going along with this bullshit. Not going along with this bullshit. I feel like that all the time. I'm not going along with it. And uh, f forces at play that you're probably aware of on the upright one, Akashic Records, Divine Temple, reversed 18, the moon. We have a reversed four turning in, turning in all those outside voices. So somebody, somebody's opening their eyes and, and kind of, and they're going to say, okay, now I got something to say to you. All right. And uh, course of action. Or that's what's been happening, right? I got something to say to you. I'm saying it, right? Somebody's saying. Remember, this isn't about me. I speak in I statements and from first person because that's that's my filter, right? But I'm not talking about me. So we have a course of action, the reverse 33, and the reverse 8 of water. We have a reversed 5, the outsider. The outsider looking in. No longer an outsider, baby. Now you on the inside. Now you on the inside, gang. Hmm? And... Out, um, outcome on the reverse 24, fifth dimensional activation, and the upright zero, the dreamer, um, or in, in other decks, the zero is the fool. So that's an, also a major arcana card. We have a reversed Roman, Roman numeral four, the rebel, breaking the change chains. So no, not a rebel. Doesn't have to be a rebel. All right? Rebel, rebel, you tore your dress. Rebel, rebel, your face is a mess. 
It's not saying you got to be like everybody else. It's not saying you're being conformist, but you don't got to be non-conformist either, right? No need to cut off your nose to spite your face. No need to do that. Do you, boo? All right? Oh, I got the creepy eyes today, hmm? It's one of the creepy ones. They're not the super glowy ones. These are the ice cold ones. That Karen Carpenter. I sang a bunch of her songs yesterday. They're so much fun. They they're they're mostly down in the lower register, my lower register, right? And so breathing technique is different than than when I'm singing, you know, things that are in the higher part of my of my range. Um, but even when you're when you're breathing that way, to then focus that to focus that resonance out through the mask of the face, it's like you vibrate your sinuses. <laughs> good it's it's good uh good to get the get the pollen out of your face i think the pollen counts down because my face hasn't been itching today anyway another story maybe you want to hear another one who haven't we heard who haven't we met we haven't met Corey. Corey's in the other book who else is in, in this one? We haven't read, met everybody in here. Oh, Saeed. Let's meet Saeed. Wrote this one um, the day before and the day of my birthday. So it started on January 22nd of this year and it was finished on my birthday. Saeed. In three hours, Saeed's brother was supposed to arrive from Toronto. Fawaz had been teaching mathematics at the university for almost 20 years. Saeed remembered when he had come home to tell his parents he had gotten the job after finishing his PhD and working as a TA. Mama had cried with joy and kissed his cheeks over and over, and Baba had actually smiled and allowed Mama to serve Fawaz first when they sat down for dinner. That night over tea, Fawaz and Baba had sat like equals in the living room and watched the evening news while Saeed had sat at the cleared kitchen table doing his geometry homework while his mother did the dishes. Saeed's mother had patted his cheeks with her damp hands, telling him not to worry. Fawaz had trouble with geometry in high school, too. Saeed didn't remember his brother having trouble with anything ever, but he had been so little when Fawaz was in high school. The next day, Baba drove Fawaz to the airport to fly back to Canada, and Mama told Saeed she had a surprise for him. Saeed was shocked. For his mother, his, his mother had a surprise for him without Baba. Mama said it was to be their secret. Saeed was a little scared. It was unlike Mama to entertain the notion of anything that could in any way be considered haram, and if Baba wasn't supposed to know about it, the surprise must certainly be haram. Saeed's mother instructed him to wash up and put on a nice shirt and meet her in the garage. He did as he was told and was shocked to find his mother sitting in the driver's seat of the van his father had bought to make deliveries for the bakery. Quickly, Saeed, get in, Mama had said, patting the seat next, next to her. Saeed did as he was told. Mama explained Baba had felt it important that she got a driver's license in case of an emergency last year when Baba had his first bout of angina. Saeed hadn't even known Baba had been ill. His mother had taken driving lessons while he was in school during the day and had always gotten back before Saeed had gotten home. Saeed had thought this must be the surprise, and his mother just couldn't keep her special freedom a secret from him anymore. Or maybe she needed him to accompany her so others didn't gossip about her going out alone. When they pulled into the music school parking lot, Saeed had been even more confused. His mother had gotten out of the van and walked up to the door before Saeed had even unbuckled himself. He had been nervous, but the smile on his mother's face convinced him to get out and follow her. Maybe it would be okay after all. Baba had allowed her to start leaving the house with her head uncovered. Perhaps he was softening in his age. That day was the first day of the rest of Saeed's life. He had his first guitar lesson. 
He learned his mother could drive, and later that afternoon, when Baba got home, he had a massive heart attack and died in the chair he had sat in while having evening tea with Fawaz the night before. All of this happened before Fawaz had landed in Toronto. When Fawaz called to say he had landed safely and was home, it was Saeed who answered the phone. The, the paramedics were carrying Baba out of a house on a stretcher covered by a sheet. Mama was standing by the door with her hands covering her throat and her mouth. Fawaz refused to come back for the funeral. His classes were to begin in less than a week, and he had students relying on him. A deep anger took root in Saeed that moment, and while his mother remained in contact with Fawaz over the years that followed, and Fawaz even sent some money every month, Saeed hadn't spoken to him since. Now, 20 years later, Fawaz was coming home to bury his mother. After Baba died, Saeed dropped out of school to help his mother run the bakery. His weekly music lesson was the only joy and his only extravagance. After a year, he and his mother had established a solid routine, and he started back to night school and got his GED. After that, he took full control of the bakery. On the rare occasion he eavesdropped in Fawaz's monthly call to their mother, Fawaz never once asked about the bakery or where Saeed was going to college. Saeed didn't really care. He mostly listened to make sure Fawaz was sending Mama the money she needed. Saeed worked at the bakery from 2 in the morning until noon, did chores from noon to 3, slept from 3 to 7, and played guitar at a shisha bar from 8 to 11. Well, he played only four nights a week anyway. The rest of his time was devoted to practice and taking care of Mama. He, he, here he was, a man nearly 36 years old, and he had never even kissed a woman other than his mother, and that was only on the cheek. Saeed had closed the bakery for the weekend and given everyone the, day, the, the days off with half-time pay. He was straightening up the living room to kill time before he was supposed to be at the airport to pick up Fawaz. Suddenly, in the center of the room, he stopped and was filled with anger. The house was as clean and, and in order as it ever was, why did he feel the need to impress Fawaz? It was the other way around, really. It was Fawaz that should be worried about impressing Saeed. Saeed washed his face and hands, brushed his teeth, and got in the van to go somewhere. He didn't know where. He figured he'd just drive around and head in the general direction of the airport. It would be okay if he was, if he was a bit behind. It would take Fawaz a while to get through customs, and Saeed didn't care if he had to wait. It had been 20 years what would another extra hour be? When Saeed had found Mama, he thought she was just sleeping, resting on the couch as she often did on the evenings when he played guitar, waiting for him to come home. He came in the door expecting her to pretend to be busy doing something other than waiting for him or watching the late night news. The TV was on and she was stretched out long with the back of her hand resting on her forehead. Saeed set his guitar case by the door and walked over to kiss his mother on the cheek and tell her to go to bed. When his lips touched her cheek, he found it oddly cool and stiff. He jostled her softly, and her arm fell away from her forehead, revealing open, waxy-looking eyes. Saeed didn't cry. He felt nothing but an overwhelming resentment toward his older brother. Saeed placed his mother's arm back where he had found it and sat down in the chair his father had died in 20 years earlier. He said a silent prayer to himself before picking up the receiver of the phone on the side table between the chair and the couch and dialing his brother's number. His brother's voice on the voicemail was strange to him. Thank you for calling, please leave a message, was all it said. So impersonal, so like Fawaz. Mama's dead, I just found her, Saeed said and hung up. Two hours later, Fawaz called back. The paramedics had just arrived. He saw on the caller ID it was Fawaz. He could leave a message. Before calling 911, Saeed called Samir to tell him he would need to open the bakery alone that morning and why. He told Samir to run the morning shift as usual, but to call the second shift workers and tell them to stay home. Samir understood and took care of it for Saeed. Samir was the son of a close friend of Saeed's father. They had, they had immigrated together. Samir had gone to high school with Fawaz and had asked bravely if Fawaz was coming home. We will see, was all Saeed had replied. After the paramedics had left with his mother, Saeed listened to the message. My flight arrives at 4 p.m. Please pick me up, was all Fawaz had said. In the van, Saeed ran his hands over the steering wheel and grit his teeth. 
What was he going to say to Fawaz? What on earth was Fawaz going to say to him? He did not know. He ended up at the airport 40 minutes early, unable to remember anything about the drive. As he parked the van near the international terminal, he felt disoriented and weak. He stumbled out of the van to a nearby bench. A woman was sitting on the far end. Normally, he would have looked for another place to sit, but his mind was swimming. He needed to sit. As Saeed fell onto the bench, the woman turned to look at him, but made no effort to shy away or move. She only looked at him with what Saeed felt was a deep warmth and compassion. A gold cross hung around her neck and caught the afternoon sun. Pardon me, Saeed said as he steadied himself on the bench. It's okay. Are you all right? The woman replied flatly. The question stung Saeed's ears and heart. It was the first time anyone had asked him since Mama's death, and he was overcome with gratitude to this woman for seeing him, for seeing his humanity. Saeed looked at the woman, meeting her penetrating gaze, and said, No, I am not. He was shocked at his own candor. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, the woman replied, holding his gaze. Then, for some reason, Saeed could not explain he told this strange woman everything from the first guitar lesson to parking the van. When he was done, Saeed felt steady. His hands propped him up on either, on either side. The woman had listened quietly but intently. Finally, she reached out and placed her hand over Saeed's. My sister's flight has been delayed for five hours. I live three hours away, so it makes no sense for me to go home and come back. I will go with you for moral support to meet your brother, the woman finally said. Saeed st uh, stared at the woman's hand on his. He had never held a woman's hand other than his mother's. It was warm and soft. The woman's hair blew around her face in the breeze. A jet engine roared as a flight took off overhead. I would like that very much, Saeed said once the plane had passed. He turned his hand to grasp the woman's palm to palm to grasp the woman's palm to palm and threaded his fingers between hers. Then they got up together and headed toward the terminal. As they passed the baggage claim area, Saeed saw his brother. It had to be him. He looked just like Baba. Fawaz, Saeed called out across the crowd. Fawaz turned, surprise registering on his face as he saw Saeed hand in hand with the woman. The three of them walked toward each other. When they were Close enough to shake hands, Fawaz began, Saeed. He got no further. Saeed released the woman's hand and punched his brother square in the face, knocking him out. So, in that story, it's ambiguous. The woman says she's picking up her sister. And there's part of me that believes that the woman in that story was a nun. But maybe not. You know, I'm not a nun. I've had um, similar kind of uh, interactions with people where um, perfect strangers have told me incredibly intimate things about themselves. And I don't know, when that stuff happens, like... The only thing you can do is bear witness. The only thing you can do is bear witness. That's part of what my dove on my hand is about. This is my right hand. The camera shows this reversed, right? And you see a mirror image of me in the video. This is my right hand. And that's part of what my dove is about. It's, it's you know, your witnessing hand. Bearing witness. I've borne witness to many, many a thing. Many, many a thing. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the stories. Hope you found some value in the card reading. Have a good day.